All right. Some of you may have noticed that Nicole wasn't up here. She's uh, down here. She is being disciplined right now. Uh, no. Uh, I don't know. She had some kind of allergic reaction, sinus thingy, and bummer, she lost her voice. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Uh, Anybody want to invite me over after church? Uh, I think I'm in trouble. All right. Now, seriously, I would like to give a shout out to Christy and Todd, their willingness to step up with her losing her voice, not being able to sing. Appreciate them very much. They did a wonderful job. With that being said, would you open your Bibles with me this morning, please? To John 14, John chapter 14. Bruce, you're going to have little pieces of paper all over the place to clean up. (laughs) We are continuing our study through the gospel of John. Uh, And here in John uh, chapter 14, Jesus is taking the time to encourage the hearts and minds of his disciples. If you remember, at this point, he's told them that one of them is going to betray him, so they're kind of already freaking out about that. Not only that, but he has been telling them consistently over the past few days and weeks that he's gonna be handed over to the religious leaders uh, in Jerusalem and that he will be killed. But don't freak out, because I'm gonna rise again in three days, because that's what happens, right? Not only that, but he's been consistently telling them that he is leaving them and that where he is going, they cannot come. He's leaving and he's going to return to the Father. Now, as you can imagine, right, this is a lot to process. And they're struggling to process it. They are anxious and they are troubled. Um, Mr. Ben, in the back, would you turn off that front fan for me, please? It's the first switch right there, kind of blowing these papers around. Perfect, buddy. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Ben. You're a big fat blessing. Where was I? They're freaking out. He's telling them that he's going to leave, return to the Father. They can't come. As you can imagine, put yourself in that situation, right? That is a lot to try and process. And I would submit to you that these chapters here where Jesus is taking the time to talk to them is proof that they are struggling to process what he is saying. And in it, they are anxious and they are troubled. You understand, they've given up their jobs, their livelihood, their lives in in many cases, right, to, to be the apprentices, the disciples, the followers of Jesus. And now their rabbi, their teacher, right, their leader, who they believe to be the Christ, is leaving them behind, Right? What are we going to do? Right? Do we go back fishing? What, what about the work? What about the mission? What, what about God's missions? Uh, his mission? What about the, the plan? I mean, for three and a half years, we, we've been working. We've been doing all of this, this work. Is this the end of the journey? Is, is it, are we done? Right? And here in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, excuse me, 16, Jesus takes the time to speak to the troubled hearts of his followers, of his disciples, and in doing so, he reminds them and encourages them to trust in him and to trust in his promises. I'm gonna submit to you already, I might have been overzealous, but we're gonna try to finish all of John 14 today. Are you ready? Look at verse 12, buckle up, buttercup. Jesus says, verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father and the Spirit's gonna come and it's gonna be amazing. Not only that, but whatever you ask in my name, this is what I'm gonna do, right? This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, 
because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. And in that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps, keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not Iscariot, but another Judas, one of the disciples, said to him, Lord, wait a second, you're the Christ. How is it that you're going to manifest yourself just to us and not to the world? Aren't you going to set up your kingdom, right? All those things we read in the book of Revelation. And Jesus said, no, not right now, right? Right now we're, we're going to do this spiritual work. If anybody loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you that I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, but I'm still the boss, he has no claim on me. Rather, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Then he says, rise, let us go from here. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this text. We, we thank you for your word that you have given us. Lord, we're asking that uh, you would open our eyes and our, our hearts, our minds, uh, Lord, uh, to see marvelous things in your word today. God, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us strength, encouragement, challenging, Lord, rebuke, uh, a building up of faith, Lord, whatever we need as we work through this text, we're praying, let your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts and in our minds today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, throughout this chapter, uh, hopefully you, you caught it as we were reading through this, Jesus is giving his disciples a series of promises where he's saying, I will, I will, I will, I will. And I want us to think through these promises this morning because not only is there so much we can learn from here, but there is, I hope you know this, right? And you probably do. There is great strength and encouragement in the promises of God. As a matter of fact, I, I think one of the main lessons of this chapter is, is simply this. Too many times, right? You and I, when our hearts and our minds get stirred, we get troubled, we, we get anxious, we, we get worried, right? Instead of doing what chapter 14 tells us to, instead of looking to Jesus and trusting in the promises that he's given us, we tend to instead look to ourselves, and to try to trust in our own abilities, our own reasoning, and our own understanding. And what happens when we do that is we do not experience peace. We do not experience comfort or encouragement. Just the opposite, it tends to make things worse. And then we look at God and we're like, hey, what's wrong? What's the matter, God? Why is this happening? And what's wrong is that you and I are looking at and trusting in the wrong things. I would submit to you today that we should be constantly celebrating, rejoicing in, and reminding ourselves of the promises of God to us in Christ Jesus. For all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Amen? All right. Well, as we get started, at least right here, right, as we look at this text and we think about the promises of God that we see here, right? The question is this, if you and I, if we are going to find strength and encouragement, right, from the promises of God, then it's got to start with this, right? Number one on your outline, if you're following along, I would encourage you to, 
On the back of your bulletin, there's a place where you could take some notes. On the left-hand side, you see points one and two. On the right-hand side, you'll see promises. We'll look at that in a minute. But for number one on your outline, I, I'm saying this. If, if we are going to be strengthened by God's promises, then we need to know God's promises. You and I, we need to become familiar with God's promises. Well, gee, I, I wonder how can we do that? By reading God's word, right? How many of you know it is a lot easier to stand on the promises of God when you actually know what they are? Like the old song says, right? Standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God. It's a lot easier to stand on those promises when I actually know what he's promised, what I can stand on. So let's take a look again at these promises. Uh, I, I've found eight of them. That's where you see promises on the right-hand side. We have eight promises that we're going to look at this morning that Jesus gives his disciples to speak to their heart's peace as they anticipate his, his return to the Father. And so at the same time, why don't we be encouraged and strengthened from these promises? We're going to start in verse 12. He says, he, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He tells Philip, hey, look, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Believe me or else believe on account of the works. You guys have been a part of all of this. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Like we saw earlier, right? He's telling them to trust in him, to believe in him, right? And then he lets them know here in, in this, this text that the mission that they've given their life to over the past three and a half years, that mission is not over, but rather it will continue, check this, through them. He is going to the Father. They're going to send the Holy Spirit. And through faith in Jesus and the empowerment of the Spirit, the mission will continue. The work will continue. And on an even greater scale than what they've already known. Number one, on your outline underneath promises, I'm calling this the, the promise of mission and purpose. Here Jesus gives us this promise that we have a mission and we have purpose. Right? And as we think about this in the immediate context here of Jesus telling his, his disciples right, that they're going to continue this work, right, we look at the book of Acts as proof of that. This promise is fulfilled when we go to the book of Acts because what do we see? The works. The works are continued, right? However, I would say to you it's fulfilled in part. And the reason why I say that is because I believe this promise extends to you and me today. Just like the disciples here in our text, so too, right, you and I have this promise from Jesus, a promise of mission and purpose in Jesus Christ. Consider what it says here in Matthew chapter 28. Verses 19 through 20. We know this is the Great Commission. Right? Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we have this, this mission. Jesus gives his disciples. You and I are here because they were faithful to the mission. They went out and made disciples, reaching people for Jesus, teaching them to observe all that he commanded, and then training others to make disciples who then went and reached other people for Jesus, taught them about Jesus, and then trained them to make other disciples that eventually come to us. And guess what? You and I have that same mantle upon us. We have that same mission. You and I are held accountable by God, right, in his sovereignty to go make disciples. We are supposed to be reaching people for Jesus, teaching them about Jesus and the word of God, training them to then go and make more disciples, we have this mission, we have this purpose. Look at what uh, Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. This is great. We rejoice in verse 17, right? All of my sins, all the old, yucky, sinful Scott is dead and buried. He gone, 
right? I am a new creation now in Jesus Christ. And as a new creation in Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to wander this planet like a lost goose. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Right? Is that as, oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse 18, you don't know what's coming next, but he's going to say, and here's what you're going to do as a new creation. Sit down in a chair. Look at the context. Look what he says here in verse 18. All of this. Right, everything that he's been talking about here, the fact that we are born again, right? All of this is from God who through Christ reconciled to himself and he did this and in doing so he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Look at this, verse 20. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Once again, I do not think this is just for the apostles, the 12, and for no one else. This is true of us. I am a new creation in Christ. As a new creation in Christ, now I am in this world as an ambassador of the king and his kingdom. I am representing Jesus in this world. I have a purpose as his ambassador. And not only that, I have a mission to compel people to be reconciled to God, to make disciples. As a matter of fact, part of this thing that Jesus is talking about here, he says, look, the Holy Spirit's gonna come and it's gonna change everything. You don't understand that one of the main reasons, one of the main things the Holy Spirit is doing in us is helping us to fulfill these works and these mission. Look at it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will sit on your butt and eat Cheetos all day long. No. The Holy Spirit will come upon me and I will be a witness of Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? The reason why I say this is a promise that we can find comfort and strength in is this, because I see way too many Christians humdrumming around Seeking God like he's hiding from them some secret mission and plan that he has for their life. And they're just like, I just don't know my purpose. I just don't know what God wants me to do. Why am I here on this planet? Guess what? The Lord brought you here today. And by the authority of God's word, I get to tell you, I know what your purpose is. I know what your plan is. Do you know what the mission is? Make disciples. Be an ambassador of Christ. Listen, I tell you, I haven't been in this business quite as long as some people, but I've been in long enough to know this. I have never had a conversation with a Christian that is actively using their mouth to be a witness and to disciple people saying, I feel like God's got no purpose and no mission for me. Never. Do you know who comes to me and they're like, I just feel like I've got no purpose and no mission. I don't even know anything. Those people are the ones that refuse to say anything with boldness about Christ to anybody. And those are the ones who refuse to take the mantle to make disciples thinking that, I don't know, it's just magically going to happen. Here's a promise that you can stand on. If you want fulfillment of mission and purpose... Open your mouth and share the gospel with somebody. You want to feel the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life? How about you stop just worrying about yourself all the time and you actually invest in somebody else to disciple them? Shut up. That's good preaching. (laughs) It's okay. You guys can shout me down. Your life does have purpose. It does have a mission. You have been recruited, hand-selected, By the Lord of glory to be a disciple maker for him and his kingdom. To teach others the good news of Jesus Christ. So let me encourage you once again, talk to somebody about Jesus today. Take some time to to work through the word of God with them. Help them to better understand. Model for them in your own life, right? What, What following Jesus looks like. Get to work for God. You and I will not find our purpose and fulfillment apart from Jesus Christ and the work that we are called to do for him and his kingdom. Amen?
This leads me to promise number two, right? With this promise of mission and purpose, this isn't number two on the left, but number two on the right underneath promises. I put it like this, the promise of prayer, with this promise of going and, and fulfilling our purpose as ambassadors of Christ, participating in the mission of Christ to, to make disciples, he gives us this promise of prayer. Amen. Look at verse 13. In this, as you move forward through the Spirit of God to continue these works, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name... I will do it. What a promise. Unfortunately, what happens is you and I, we tend to let out our selfishness and the self-centered idolatry of our lives. We kind of let that shine when we read a text like this because in our sinful, fallen humanity, our, our minds say, yes, <laughs> Jesus just gave me a pass. He said I could ask for whatever I want. Jesus, I want a million dollars, and I don't want to ever be sick, and actually make it five million dollars, and I want a BMW, and I want a Hummer, and I don't want to ever have to work another day in my life. I just want to be able to travel world, do whatever I want to do. Amen. You're smiling because you know it's true. <laughs> right? We look at this, we're thinking, man, I can ask for whatever I want. We got to remember the context here, right? This isn't what's being said. The context is you and I fulfilling the work of God as ambassadors of Jesus Christ on this planet. Hence, whatever we ask in his name. You see, our prayers are supposed to represent the things that Jesus would ask for. Our prayers, right, are supposed to reflect the character and the nature of Jesus as his ambassador, I am representing him, I am praying and asking for these things in his name. John says it like this in 1 John, the same John who wrote this gospel. I'm, I'm sure he's, he's thinking upon the words of Jesus here in John 14 and, and what we'll see in John 15. Right? And he's thinking about this and, and he says this, look, in his first epistle, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to our will, he's going to hear us. Thank you, interactive Sunday morning. Yeah, right? We have this confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And John's so excited about this, he says, and we know that if he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Too many of us do not have this confidence in prayer. We need to stand on this promise of prayer that Christ gives us. First, you gotta be born again, right? Second is this. If I am praying according to God's will, things that represent the nature and character of Jesus in his name, then we have the promise that he will hear and he will do. That is incredible. That is why you and I should be optimistic about the mission that we've been given. When I am praying for his kingdom to advance in Belfont, for people to be saved, guess what? He hears and he will do. When I am praying for the advancement of godliness in, in whatever ministry or, or thing that is happening, as, as I think about God's work on this planet, I can have confidence that he hears and he will do. Come on, that is encouraging. Do you know why we're not closing the doors of Zion Community Church? Because he hears and he answers prayers. And there are more people that need to be saved. There are more people you need to step up and disciple. There are more people I need to step up and disciple. There are more people that need to grow stronger in their faith. There is more work for the kingdom of God to be done here in Belfont and the surrounding areas. So guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pray. And guess what my Savior's gonna do? He's gonna deliver. I don't care if I'm the only one who believes it's gonna get done. And all you turkeys are going to be like, wow, Scott was right. There is promise of prayer. Before I move on, one of the things that, that I've learned in, in this promise of prayer, 
you and I get disheartened really quick because we forget God's not American. Let me help you out. I don't know, maybe you've only been serving God for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, 60 years. Let me help you. I'm gonna save you so much. Ready? God is slow. Slow. Not slow in the head, slow in time. That's a great place for anybody that's followed Christ. Say amen. Slow. You know what I mean by American? It doesn't have to be done in a New York minute. Right? We bring our request to God, right? And he's like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And we're like, 10 seconds. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Right? Like a microwave God. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What, what are you talking about? Wait, wait, oh, wait, it's gonna take a couple of years? Oh, come on now. That's what we do. We expect God to do everything immediately. Even when it is his will, we just expect it to be immediately. Well, I prayed for this person to be saved. So, I mean, by two o'clock today, they should be saved, right? That's enough time. That is not how it works. That is why you and I have to stand on this promise, rely on this promise that when I pray in the name of Jesus, according to the will of God, he hears and he will do in his time. Amen. Let's move on. Verse 15. He says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is a great verse. Number three, under the promises, I'm calling this the promise of assurance. If you want to, you can add obedience, obedience, assurance, whatever you want to do there. But the promise of assurance, the reason why I'm calling that is because what we see is this, obedience to Jesus is evidence of love for Jesus. And that provides us with this assurance of our salvation, this assurance of our relationship with Jesus, right? Now, I'm not talking about works righteousness. We're not talking about earning salvation or a place with God, right? We're talking about grace, the same grace we we sang about this morning. Because you see, the the same grace that saves me from my sin also enables me and empowers me to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. Look at what Paul says here in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. For the grace of God has appeared right through Jesus Christ, bringing salvation for all people. That's not all without exception, it's all without distinction, all kinds of people, black, white, yellow, green, blue, tall, short, whatever, right? All kinds of people. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. We're saved by God's grace, right? But check this out, that same grace, look look at this, is training us, teaching us to say no, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. You understand, the Apostle Paul here in Titus is just saying the same thing that he learned about God's new covenant from the Old Testament in Ezekiel. He's just saying the same thing that God has said. Look at what God said here in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 through 27, as he talks about this new covenant, this new thing he's gonna do with the people of God. He says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. Do you know what we call that? Born, born, born again. Thank God I'm born again. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Look at this. I'm gonna remove that heart of stone that was hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I'm gonna remove that. I'm gonna give you a heart of flesh and check this out. And I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit within you and... Shut up. What does that say? It's not a trick question. Cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in us, not only changes our hearts, not only makes us new creations in Christ Jesus, but the Holy Spirit now empowers us to walk in obedience to Jesus. You see, every time you and I obey God, that is evidence of the Holy Spirit in us, working in us. And that should provide a great sense of assurance in us that I am saved, that I am his and he is mine. 
Look at what John says here to, to continue with John in 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Look at what he says here. No one born of God, born again, makes a practice of sinning, a habitual lifestyle of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, the Holy Spirit. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. This is exactly what Jesus says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's going to be evidence. There's going to be this assurance of a change in you, right? Do you know what this means for us today? Let's just be as open and real and honest as we can be. If you are here today and you think you're a Christian, but you are consistently, habitually living a life of sinfulness, guess what? You're not born again. Who are you to say that? I'm nobody, but the Holy Spirit wrote it in his book for all of us. I don't know if you guys know this. I didn't write this, so you can't get mad at me. (laughs) I'm only 38 years old. (laughs) This thing is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And the Holy Spirit through John says this, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning. Do you want to know one of the most assuring things to me that I'm a Christian? The Holy Ghost elbow. That's what I call it, right? That conviction, right? When the Holy Spirit comes and hits you in the gut, right? Whenever I'm like, "Mm," I just, "Mm." Holy Spirit, just let me tell this guy what's up. Just let me say a few words. Just tell him how I feel. And Jesus Christ, please. And the Holy Spirit says, no, no, no. You get that, 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 that elbow. Come on, you guys know what I'm talking about. Right, that, that conviction. It could be in the middle of a fight with a spouse, right? It could be all of a sudden, right? I, I'm, I'm promoting this, this thing. I, I'm being selfish or, or whatever it is. And the Holy Spirit ugh, says, Scott, Scott, look. He cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God. He dwells in me. He is concerned about what I say and what I do. Now, we can harden our hearts. We can resist the Holy Spirit. But that's not a healthy thing to do. Look what he says next in verse 10. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And he's going to go on to talk about that in 1 John. As we think about this, I want to make sure we're clear on this, right? John and and Jesus here in our text, they are not talking about sinless perfection. You guys are familiar with that, right? The idea that on this side of glory, in this body, I can be sinlessly perfect. You know what that means? I never mess up. I never make a mistake in my thoughts. Never make a mistake in my actions and my response. <laughs> I know, right? We're all thinking, no, Scott, we know you. Yeah, right? Well, I know you too. None of us are sinlessly perfect. I know there's some strains of churches and theology out there that teach that, but they're wrong and they're sinning. Did you see what I did there? No, okay. First service thought that one was kind of funny, so. We are not sinlessly perfect. You will not be sinlessly perfect in this life. But what Jesus is saying here and what John is saying here is as you look at my life, I should have this trajectory of sinning less and less and less and obeying God more and more and more. That is the evidence of God in my life. If you love me, you will obey me. Amen? That's good to know. All right. It's a good promise. And like we said, it's all made possible because he promised the Holy Spirit. And that's where we go next. Look at verse 16. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Remember last week we looked at that word another, right? Another of the same kind, not another of a different kind, but another one just like me who's going to come and he's going to help you and he's going to be with you forever forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Number four on the promises, I'm calling this the promise of help. The promise of help. 
I hope by now that you and I understand the only way we can live for Jesus, the life that we are called to live, is through the help of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. You and I are hopeless without the Holy Spirit in our lives. We cannot live the life we are called to live without the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus said it's better for us that he go back to the Father so that the Holy Spirit would come. So as I think about this, man, I'm praising God for the Holy Spirit in my life, for that promise of help, right? And not temporary help, right? The Holy Spirit's not coming to fill a temp job, right? He says he is here forever. Jesus says another helper, just like him, co-equal, remember we talked about this, co-equal in wisdom and in power and in glory. Let's make sure we understand, right? With the, the Jesus going to the Father, they send in us the Holy Spirit. We, the Holy Spirit's not a lesser member of the Trinity. It's not like when Jesus was on earth, the disciples were getting varsity level help. And now the Holy Spirit's here and dang it, we gotta deal with JV help from the Holy Spirit. You understand that that's not the case. The Holy Spirit is varsity level help, just like Jesus. Just as Jesus has spent the past three and a half years with his disciples, helping them, leading them, teaching them, educating them, praying with them, guiding them, rebuking them. So Jesus says, listen, now another helper, another one just like me is gonna come and he's gonna help you and he's gonna lead you and he's gonna guide you and he's gonna counsel you. But it's not gonna be, you understand, if Jesus was still here in the flesh and I wanted a conversation with him, I'm gonna have to wait because he's one guy in the flesh. Not only that, but what if the dude's in Jerusalem? <sighs> When's he getting back? I'm over here in Belfont. Do you understand that we have no need to wait? Because Jesus has gone back and they have sent the Holy Spirit, who's not just with us, he is in us. And I now have immediate, immediate access to God to find the help and the strength that we need. He's the spirit of truth and he's gonna lead them in truth. He's gonna equip them for the task they have to do. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's gonna teach you guys all things and he's gonna bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Do you understand? We have the gospel of John because the Holy Spirit did this. We, we have the New Testament Bible because the Holy Spirit did this reminded them and taught them and led them and guide them and they recorded it for us. Praise God for that. Jesus says he's the spirit of truth. But he does say this, the world can't receive him because it neither sees him nor knows him. Right, the idea there, the, the world, unsaved people, right, the, the system of, of unregenerated, unredeemed, not born again people. We know this, this, here's why they can't see him or know him. They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually blind. We, we learned that in, in Ephesians chapter two and in 1 Corinthians chapter two, right? They, they are spiritually dead, spiritually blind. I don't know if you know this or not, but dead people don't respond very well. No matter how much I, I talk to them, no matter how much I tempt them, guess what dead people do? Nothing, because they're dead, <laughs> right? No matter how much I try to get them to look and see something, guess what? They don't see it, because they're dead. Jesus is saying this world will not be able to receive the Spirit. You have to be born again. They cannot know or receive the Spirit or things of the Spirit. We've already highlighted this idea, but he says, right, he's not just with you, he's gonna be in you. And what we see is this, the new covenant we have through the blood of Jesus Christ, right? In that, we now become the dwelling place of God. This is so huge. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's focal point, uh, his presence, is no longer a temple made of, of stone or brick or wood, but it's now us through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, 
The Father and the Son are connected with us and dwell in us through the person of the Holy Spirit, whom we have received through faith in Jesus Christ. This leads me to my next two promises, number five and number six. Number five, we have the promise of closeness, and in number six, we have the promise of love. These are two great promises to stand upon, and I pray the Holy Spirit would encourage your hearts with these. The promise of closeness with God and the promise of the love of God. Verse 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you're going to see me. And then he says this, because I live, you also will live. I love this. Jesus says he's not going to leave them as orphans. And because I live, you will live. I don't, think, I don't know if you understand just how awesomely amazing that is. You see, what Jesus is teaching us, what the word of God teaches us is this. My spiritual life, that born again life that is in me, right, is directly correlated and linked to the resurrected life of Christ. So important that we see that, so huge. My spiritual life is directly related, linked to the resurrected life of Jesus. I am spiritually alive because he is alive. Because he lives, I live. Now when you think about it, this is something we see throughout the New Testament. Let me give you a couple examples here. In Colossians chapter three, Verses one through four, the apostle Paul, he's preaching or writing and he says this, since you have been, that's what if, it can be if or since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, right? That this idea that when Christ died, I was joined with him by faith. I died with him. I've been buried with him. I've been raised now to this newness of life, right? Since that's the case, I need to be a heavenly minded person, a kingdom minded person. I need to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I'm gonna set my mind, my, my affections, my, my will, all right, I'm, I'm gonna set this on things that are above. As an ambassador, I'm a kingdom-minded person, not on things that are on the earth, because I have died, and my life, my real life, this spiritual, eternal life is hidden with Christ and God, and when Christ, who is my life, do you see that link there? I cannot have eternal life apart from the resurrected life of Jesus. I don't have spiritual life apart from Jesus. When he, Christ, who is my real life, appears, then I will appear with him in glory. In Romans chapter six, verses eight through 11, he says this, if we have died with Christ, just like I said, then we believe that we will live with Christ. And we know that Christ, look at this, being raised from the dead, will never die again. That's so powerful. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul says, we need to think this way. We, we must consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Such a powerful truth. In Galatians chapter two, verse 20, I live because he lives. He lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Should I? No. What a promise. Because I live, you will live. Yeah, all right. Look at verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and, I, and you in me and I in you. I called this the promise of closeness. We're not gonna be lonely orphans. Instead, 
We are connected right to our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, through the person of the Holy Spirit. Right, look again at the closeness in, in, these, in these things. And that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. I hope you understand this morning that I think too many of us miss this, right? The ultimate purpose of salvation is, is not about not going to hell. It's about being accepted and invited into the eternal communion and friendship of God. That's what salvation is all about. You and I, we're even dumb in how we talk about things. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying. Right? Well, I'm, I went to church and I said a prayer and I trust in Christ. I got my get out of jail free card here, right? Just salvation means that my sins are forgiven and God's going to love me no matter what I do and I don't have to go to hell. Right? Can, can I help you? You're either not saved or you are totally missing the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation does mean my sins are forgiven and that I do not have to face eternal wrath of God for my sins against him. But even more so, salvation means this. The eternal communion, fellowship, love of Father, Son, and Spirit, I now have been invited to celebrate that, to participate in that. That is so huge, such an important thing. The greatest thing about the gospel of God is that we get God. That's what Jesus is worried about here. This is what he says. If you read, you can jump ahead, chapter 17, his high priestly prayer. This is what he's praying all the time, that the disciples would know the fellowship of the Father and the Son, that they would participate in the love that the Father has with the Son and that the Son has with the Father and that it would overflow into their lives. Look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them Right? He it is who loves me. Actually, this, this, this next part here, it, it ties right into, look at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he adds to it this time and he says, and he who loves me, look at this, will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I don't know about you, but that is good encouraging that the Father wants to pour out his love on me, that Jesus wants to, to, to express his love and, and manifest himself to me. You see, the, the heart that is changed by Jesus and the gospel, that becomes a, a heart that is changed and influenced by the love of God himself. What we see here is that the Holy Spirit comes and changes us. He gives us this spiritual life fills us with love for Jesus. And not only that, but now a desire and power to walk in obedience to Jesus. Jesus says, whoever has my commands and keeps them, this is the one who loves me. And he who loves me, look at this, will be loved by my Father. So what I see here is, is as I walk in loving obedience to Jesus through the help and the power of the Holy Spirit, right, the Father then responds to this by pouring out even more of his love into my heart and life. And then that stirs me up even more, causing me to walk even more in loving obedience to Jesus. I call it a circle of love. It's, it's, it's this amazing thing. The Holy Spirit is in me, working in me, helping me right to, to love Jesus by walking in obedience to him. And as I do that, God the Father says, Ha! It out. Whoa, that's awesome. I love this guy. And he pours out even more love onto me. And as I receive more love from the Father and Son, I'm like, I love Jesus even more. And I begin to walk in even more obedience to God. And it's this cycle that goes over and over again. Listen, here's my prayer. If you guys are looking at me, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I pray you will find out today what I'm talking about what it is like to walk in loving obedience to Christ and have the Father pleased with that and to feel the pleasure and the love of the Father in your heart and life that causes you to just obey even more. 
but I know some of you guys, right? You're like, I'm a big, tough guy, Scott. I ain't into all that gushy, mushy, filling stuff. Good, great news. Might surprise you. Neither am I. Can we be real? Loving obedience to Jesus is hard. It is hard. I'm not talking about gushy, mushy, like, oh, I love them, butterflies. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. When it's hard, the Holy Spirit gives me that strength and I choose to walk in obedience to Christ. I have the confidence that that is evidence of my love and my salvation for Christ and it is evidence of God's love towards me. And it just keeps going over and over and over again. Look, Jesus didn't say the person who claps the loudest is the one who loves me the most. Jesus didn't say the person in worship that sings the loudest and moves their hands the most in worship is the one who loves me the most. That's how we tend to think of it, right? Well, let me tell you right now, you could be the person in here raising your hands, clapping your hands all day long, but you're not walking in obedience to Jesus and you're just deceiving yourself. Somebody in here could maybe not be as expressive, but every single day they're walking in loving obedience to Christ. Let's make sure you and I judge righteous judgment here. Be that as it may, the promise is this, right? There's this closeness and the promise of experiencing the love of God in our lives. It's a great promise. Verse 22, I told you guys it's a lot, but we're gonna do it. It's all downhill from here. Judas, not Iscariot. Judas was a super popular name. You guys understand why Judas was so popular in this day, right? You know how popular names come up? Are you guys familiar with the story of the Maccabees in that intertestamental period? Judas Maccabees was one of the big leaders that led that revolt to defend the temple uh, against the people that were de- defacing it and defaming it and stuff like that. So Judas became a name like hero, right? And so that's why you see so many Judases. But after Iscariot, you don't see anybody named Judas anymore because... Now we're not thinking of the Maccabees Judas. Now we think of the betrayer Judas. So this is just another Judas, right? One of the other disciples, he says, Lord, how is it that you are gonna manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Right? You're the Christ. Aren't you setting up your kingdom? Of course, there's gonna be a little bit of a pause here in this time of the Gentiles. We've got this thing. Verse 23, Jesus says to him, if anybody loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. We just talked about that. And we will come to him and make our home with him. We talked about that as well, that idea of, of the promise of love and this promise of closeness, right? Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So once again, we just are tying up these, these things, the promise of help, the promise of, of love, the promise of closeness as, as we look at these things. And it's gonna lead us to our next promise, number seven on your outline, And this is a good one, the promise of peace. They're all good, but the promise of peace. Look at verse 25, if you would, please. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's gonna teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. We looked at that already. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, right? You've got to make sure your understanding of peace is with mine, not with the world's. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let's think through this promise of peace real quick. As you study the word of God, you see we have the promise of peace at least in two different ways. The first is, through Jesus Christ, we have what's called peace with God, Peace with God. That means God and I are no longer enemies fighting against each other, right? Where where I am in opposition to God. That's our state as, as fallen humanity. We are in opposition to God. We are not all God's children. We're not all okay with God. We have a huge problem with sin that needs to be addressed. I am by default born into this world an enemy of God. But I can have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And not only that, not only do I become a friend of God, the Bible says this, I become adopted into God's family. He takes me in as a son. No longer are we fighting against each other, but now we embrace as father and son. 
And that is all because of Jesus. Praise God. That's the grace of God that we're singing about this morning. That I am accepted and loved by my Father because of him. I have peace with God. Not only do we have peace with God, specifically our text here, what Jesus is talking about is the peace of God. The peace of God. Right, That's the, the peace that we have in the midst of our troubles and, 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 and difficulties and stuff like that. Remember, he says, it's not the same way the world works. For the world, the idea of peace is we stop fighting. There's no more battles, no more wars, no, no more, more anything like that. The idea of peace of God is not a ceasing of trials, of troubles, of wars, or battles, but it is this supernatural peace even in the midst of storms, troubles, trials, and battles, and wars, whatever it might be. As I was thinking about this, I, I thought of a, a great example. Uh, for Easter, we talked about the example where Jesus was sleeping in the boat, Right, that, that idea of this peace and confidence that he had. Here's, a, here's another example of this. We find it in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, just a, a beautiful poetic picture here in verses four through five. The psalmist says this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. See, for us, we're thinking if God's gonna give us peace, we're gonna be as far away from that valley of death as we possibly can be. But that's not the peace that Jesus gives us. The peace of God is the supernatural peace of God that carries me through the valley of the shadow of death. Even in the midst of this, everybody is freaking out, but not me. I'm gonna fear no evil because he's with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. This is is probably one of my favorite verses, verse five in in this whole psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That is like one of my most favorite lines. I love that. Do Do you get the image of that? The audaciousness and the boldness of that? Imagine you and I are enemies, right? It's me against all of you guys, right? You guys over here have your bazookas and your Uzis and you're coming at me, right? You guys have sniper rifles, grenades, I don't know, bows and arrows, a, a stagger, a dagger because you just want to like <laughs> or come at me, right? All of you guys are lined up. It's me against all of you. Who are you putting your money on? And I got no weapons. Well, Daisy and Red Rider. <laughs> my, my two guns, that's all I got. Against all of you guys, imagine you come to advance to kill me and destroy me. And I'm like, time, 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 time out, time out. And I set a table, put the cloth over it, light my candle. Mm, that's pretty. Got my little glass of bubbly, bubbly, some prime rib and shrimp. And I'm like, oh, one, one second. And I just cut my prime rib and shrimp looking at you guys. What's up? How you doing? You guys are going to be like, uh, okay, he is out of his mind. We need to kill him right now, right? He, he's nuts, right? Do you understand why I can eat a victory meal in front of you? Because I've already won and you've already lost. I don't think you heard me. The devil has already lost. I don't care what he throws my way. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Nanny, 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 you lose. Come on, this is beautiful. Don't you see that? Jesus has given me a victory meal before the battle even starts. That's how confident he is. That's the peace of God. He anoints my head, right, with with oil. My cup overflows. I love that imagery. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thought. God is not freaking out saying, oh, wow, I wonder what we're going to do. He is already won, and I can rest in his victory. And whenever I do, that's when we find, I'm sure you've seen this before, right, that supernatural peace is when we find that. When you, you know an aged saint, Right? They're, they're going through something horrible and you look at them and they're like, I just have the peace of God in my heart and my life. Everybody, like, why aren't you nuts? Why are you freaking out? Everybody else, they're, they're, they'll be going crazy with everybody pointing Uzis and machine guns at their face. You're just like chowing down on some prime rib. 
Hey, guys. <laughs> right? That's nuts. Do you know what the Bible calls that? A peace that surpasses all understanding. Do you understand? You ready? That's for me. That's the promise he gives me that I can experience peace. I'm not making it up. Look at it again. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives. Right? I'm not gonna cease all these things, but even in the midst of them, you are going to have peace. Come on, that's good. I hope that encourages someone here today. Verse 28, let's finish. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I, not in deity or, or in being God, but in role and function. And now I have told you before it takes place, look at this, I'm telling you guys before this happens so that when it does happen, you will believe me I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming, coming Satan, but he has no claim on me. Rather, I'm doing as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. What we see in this one, number eight on your outline for the last promise this morning, I'm calling it the promise of control. The promise of control. What a promise for you and I to hold on to. Jesus is in control. He says, look, I'm telling you guys all of this before it even happens so that when it happens, you will remember and you will believe in me. And then he reminds them, right? Everything that's happening is all planned and it's all under my control. Regardless of what it may look like, I know from the outside, you guys are, are gonna be looking and it's looking like I'm losing. It's looking like the ruler of this world is having his day. But he has no claim on me. I love that, right? It's like, I'm, dude, I'm the boss. He's, he's got no claim. Other translations say like this, he has nothing in me. He has no hold on me. I love this one. He has no power over me. Do you guys realize that? Even, even here, Satan is no match for Jesus. You understand, as a matter of fact, Satan can't even do anything unless Jesus gives him the okay to do that. I don't think you guys understand. He is the boss. He is God. Satan, you might be surprised, is not God. He's an angel. He's created. Yeah, he's fallen and horrible and awful, but even then, he can't just do whatever he wants. Do you understand? All of creation has to submit to the authority and power and control of God. Come on, this is good news. You need to know this even in your life. Satan can't do just whatever the heck he wants to do whenever the heck he wants to do it. He answers to God just like all of creation answers to God. This is so important. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this. Like, he's got no claim on me. Everything you guys see me doing here, getting my beard pulled out, punched in the face, stripped naked, ripped to where all you can see is bone and blood, all of this is not the enemy having victory over me. Look at it. I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. What I'm trying to tell you here is our God is the only God and he is in control. This is such a promise to hold on to. Even when it seems like everything's falling apart, I can stand on the promise that he is in control. On your left side of your outline as we close. For number one, I told you this. If we're gonna stand on the promises of God, if we're gonna be encouraged and strengthened by the promises of God, then we need to know them. We need to become familiar with them. Well, guess what? We just spent the past hour becoming familiar with eight promises. I wanna encourage you to look at those, think through those, pray through those. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's doing in you. I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you need to hold on to the promise of assurance. Maybe it's the promise of peace. Right? Maybe it's the promise of closeness, that God is with me. I've been invited into this communion with Father, Son, and, and Spirit. I don't know what it needs or, or where your needs are. But number two on your outline, here's, here's what we're gonna do to close. I'm gonna call you to confidently trust in the promises of God. Continue to become familiar with these promises, like the eight that we looked at here, and then don't just become familiar with them, but confidently trust in them. Trust in the promises of God. The old song says, standing, 
right? Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Nobody wants to join me? That's okay. We'll leave the singing to the singers. Confidently trust in the promise of God. Rely, trust in, rest in, believe, find strength in the promises of God. Man, there have been so many times of my, in my life where I have not known what to do and, and all I can do is hold on to the promises of God. Amen? I pray this was encouraging and edifying and strengthening. And look at that. We went through almost the entire chapter on a Sunday morning. I'm slightly impressed that, that I made it. Uh, probably not going to try that again. Uh, so before you guys leave, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all that you've done to give us this book. Even as we think about this first point, Lord, of becoming familiar with your promises, Lord, we just want to confess and, and, and apologize, God, for all the excuses we always give you for why we can't make time for more of your word in our lives. We have no good excuse, Lord. Forgive us for this lack of love and desire for your word. No wonder we struggle to stand on the promises of God because we don't even know them. We don't make time. But God, not only do we confess that sin, we stand on the promise of help. God, even as we look at your word today, we see that you have given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk in obedience to you. So Holy Spirit, we're asking, help us to love the word of God. Help us to, to make time for the word. Help us to, to have the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Help us to walk in obedience to these things. And not only that, but, but Master, we ask that you would help us to stand confidently, trusting in the promises of God. No matter what the rest of this day brings, no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in our life, help us to be people who are confident in the promises of God. Lord, we thank you for this this morning. We do very much appreciate you, Lord Jesus, and all that you have done for us. To you be the honor and the glory and the power and the praise forever and ever. Help us to love you the way you deserve to be loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you guys, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Have a good week. God bless you.